Thank you for joining us for this webinar on recent state and local pension reforms and how they are affecting retirement security and state and local government's fiscal position. Today we are joined by Richard Johnson, Senior Fellow in the Income and Benefits Program here at the Urban Institute and Director of the Program on Retirement Policy. Jean-Pierre Aubrey is joining us from the Boston College Center for Retirement Research where he is Assistant Director of State and Local Research and Bill Gale, the R.J. and Francis Miller Chair in Federal Economic Policy and Economic Studies at the Brookings Institution um, is joining us as well. Um, so today we're exploring a new format, a webinar, because we'd like to feature some new tools that, were, that will be available soon on our website as well as on the Boston College Center for Retirement Research website. These tools were created to help uh, assess the assumptions behind state and local pension plans and rapidly changing parameters of these plans. As you undoubtedly know, um, there's been a lot of ferment in this area. Since 2009, 45 states have reformed their pension plans, either by increasing employee contributions, uh, reducing cost of living adjustments, increasing age or service requirements, or some combination of the above. Um, it remains to be seen if these reforms will hold in the first place after a recent uh, Illinois County Court decision, for example, which um, brought into question whether they conflict with the state's strong protections of the Constitution against impairment of contract. Um, and if they, if they do hold, how they will affect workers and um, their incomes going forward, as well as um, states and their fiscal sustainability. And there's also questions about long-term effects on public sector workforces and the ability to attract and retain high-quality workers and provide high-quality services um, for residents. Um, so today we'll start with Rich Johnson, then go to J.P. Aubrey, and uh, I'm sorry, no, then Bill Gale, and then J.P. Aubrey. So Rich, please take it away. Thank you, Tracy. Well, my talk today uh, is first going to describe how an actual pension reform affected the distribution of benefits received by retirees, and then I'll consider the potential impact of alternative reform. And finally, I'll conclude with a short introduction to our new pension reform tool. But before I actually begin with that, I want to briefly discuss some principles of reform. What are the characteristics of good pension plans? So first, we believe that future benefits should be fully funded. The taxpayer should finance the full cost of government services each period, which means paying for the increment for future retirement benefits that government employees earn each year in addition to their salary. It's both inefficient and inequitable for current taxpayers to avoid some of these costs and shift them to future generations of taxpayers. Second, the plan should provide retirement security to government employees. That, after all, is the primary purpose of the retirement plan. And importantly, all employees should be put on a path to a secure retirement, not just full career employees. Third, the plan should be part of an overall compensation package that allows employers to attract and retain qualified workers at a reasonable cost. So it should be attractive to younger workers, many of whom will remain with the employer for less than a full career, especially as workers change jobs more frequently. And it shouldn't encourage older employees to retire early while they are still productive and willing and able to continue working. Fourth, all employees should be treated fairly. What employees get out of the plan per year of work shouldn't vary dramatically based on when they are hired or how long they remain employed. They should receive equal pay for equal work. And finally, these objectives have to be achieved at a reasonable cost. Now, reconciling all of these goals is not always easy. On the one hand, we want to improve financing, perhaps by controlling costs, but we also want to maintain adequate benefits and attract and retain qualified workers. And so there's some tension among these three goals. Another important question is how should reform costs be distributed? What, what uh, portion of the cost should be borne by taxpayers? What portion by current retirees and current employees? What portion by new and future employees? And then related to that is the question of who should pay for unfunded legacy costs. And in particular, how much should current and new hires um, be, uh, be forced to cover some of these costs through lower benefits. So to see how recent reforms have affected government employees, let's look at California's teacher plan, CalSTRS, the largest teacher plan in the nation. My colleague Ben Southgate and I have analyzed this plan with funding from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, and our report is on our website. Now, because the plan is so poorly funded, state policymakers cut benefits for teachers hired in 2013 and later. And the plan provisions for these new teachers are shown in the first column of the table. So first, employees must work at least five years to collect a pension. That's the vesting period. 
And once they vest, they're entitled to a pension that pays an annual benefit equal to a percentage of final average salary multiplied by final years of service. Final average salary is computed as the highest three consecutive earning years. Members can begin collecting benefits at age 55, but the plan multiplier increases if they delay collecting their pension. So if they're retired at age 55, their annual benefit equals 1.16% of final average salary times years of service. If they wait till 60, say, to begin collecting, the multiplier rises to 1.86%. If they wait till 65, it reaches 2.4%. Um, that's the maximum amount. After retirement, benefits increase automatically 2% per year. That's um, designed to offset any increases in the cost of living. But note that that is a fixed escalator. It's not directly tied to uh, changes in the consumer price index. And so um, it, it increases 2% regardless of what inflation does. Employees have to contribute to their pension. Uh, now the contribution rate is 8% of salary, but it's increasing. And by 2017, we will reach 9.2% for uh, people hired, uh, teachers hired after uh, January 1st, 2013. Uh, now, in, uh, teachers do have the option when they leave of uh, simply getting their contributions back with interest uh, instead of getting a pension so they can just choose to forego their pension. Uh, the refund on those contributions is 4.5% per year. That is less than what the state trustees assume that the state will earn on those contributions. Uh, they, they assume that they will earn 7.5% so that the state is implicitly uh, making money on uh, teacher contributions for teachers who choose the uh, refund. If we look at um, the benefits for teachers who were hired before 2013, that's the column on the right there, and that's the CalSERS 2% at 60 tier, the basic difference between the benefits offered to people, teachers who were hired before 2013, is that they, they can begin collecting benefits earlier, so they be, can begin collecting at age 50 if they have 25 years of service, and the plan multiplier is uh, consistently higher for these teachers, so they will get uh, larger benefits. But let's uh, focus on the benefits for teachers uh, who are hired today. And this chart shows annual pension benefits uh, at age 75 for teachers hired at age 25 today. If they leave after just 10 years of service, so at age 35, the benefits that they collect 40 years later at age uh, 75 will be just $3,500 a year. Um, that's in 2014 dollars. But that benefit will grow substantially if they work longer. So if they work for 30 years, they'll get $28,000. If they work for 40 years, they'll get $90,000. And benefits increase with years of service because final average salary grows over time. That final average salary is multiplied by more years of service and separated employees don't have to wait so long to begin collecting benefits, so their benefits don't erode as much because of inflation. And then after age 55, additional years of service raise the multiplier. So we see a big increase from 30 years of service when these 25 year old hires would be age 55 to 40 years of service when they would be 65. That's really why those benefits are increasing so much. So this is a snapshot for benefits uh, for one year in time. What do they look like? over a lifetime. And that's what's shown on this slide. Um, so this is the expected value of lifetime benefits received by an age 25 hire, and you see how it varies with years of service. Uh, for the first five years, the teacher doesn't receive any, any benefits because they're not yet tested. After that, benefits increase slowly, but then they really begin to increase rapidly, uh, beginning at 30 years of service, um, so that if you've completed 40 years of service, uh, the average lifetime benefit uh, for that teacher would be about uh, almost $1.3 million. Again, that's in today's dollars. Um, after 40 years of service, lifetime benefits don't increase much. That's because the multiplier is fixed at 2.4%. Um, the annual benefit is going to increase a little bit because um, there's additional years of service that enter into the formula. But um, that increase in annual benefits is largely offset by the fact that those who work longer are going to get a fewer actual payments. So that if for each additional year you work past 65, let's say, uh, you are going to get one year less of benefits. And so that's why we're seeing a pretty, uh, really not much increase in the value of lifetime benefits after 40 years of service. 
Um, but teachers also have to contribute toward these pensions. And this next line shows the, uh, the value of those teacher contributions. This is showing the opportunity cost of those contributions, uh, accounting for the fact that if teachers did not participate in the plan, they could have taken this money, these contributions, and invested them elsewhere and earned interest on those contributions. The difference between two lines shows how much the, uh, the state and school districts, how much the employer is contributing to the plan. For teachers with fewer than 28 years of service, the value of their contributions, the teacher contributions, are worth more than the value of future benefits so that um, the teacher is actually losing money by participating in the plan. It could have been better if they had taken their contributions and invested them elsewhere. After 28 years of service, um, they end up doing, they, they gain by participating in the plan. And that, uh, that gain can be pretty substantial. As you can see, if they had the 40 years of service, it's nearly about $300,000. Um, but again, after 40 years of service, the value of each contributions continues to increase, the value of lifetime uh, pension benefits remains fairly steady, and so we see that, it's, that, that the gain from participating in the plan really declined sharply after 40 years of service. Um, one problem, though, is that most teachers don't remain employed, don't participate in the plan long enough to really get anything out of the plan. And only 35% of teachers have lifetime benefits that are worth more than their required contribution. Even among those teachers who last who remain in the plan for 10 years, only about half of them will have lifetime benefits worth more than their required contribution. So relatively few teachers are getting anything out of the plan. Now we can also see how uh, employee benefits, how much employees benefit from the plan by computing how much employers would have to contribute each year throughout the teacher's career to finance promised benefits in combination with teacher uh, contributions. And so that's what this chart shows. This line now is for uh, someone hired at age 25. And you see that if they remained in the plan for 40 years, then uh, the benefits that they receive could be funded uh, by the uh, state and school districts contributing 7% of their salaries throughout their career to uh, the retirement fund. That's a pretty good um, contribution. That's certainly higher than what we typically see for a 401k plan in the private sector. Um, but note that if the teacher works longer than 40 years, then that effective contribution rate really declines rapidly. So it falls to maybe 4% after 45 years, only 1% on average over the course of a career, um, if they say for 49 years. Similarly, if they work fewer than 40 years, uh, the effective annual contribution from the employer also drops sharply. And it's negative if they work uh, fewer than 27 years. Uh, so for example, if they work 22 years only, so they leave really up 22 years, then in effect, they're losing 2.5% of salary each year through the retirement plan. Um, they are subsidizing longer term teachers in effect. So we see that how much uh, teachers get out of the plan really varies depending on how long they stay with um, they stay in the plan, and it also varies depending on uh, when they're hired. And so, as we see, for example, for someone hired at age 55, if they left after 10 years, uh, the effective contribution rate from the employer is 16 percent. That's dramatically different than the minus 2.5 percent for the 25-year-old hire who left after 22 years. So what this chart shows is just how much variation there is and how much people are effectively getting out of the pension plan, how sharply that varies by years of service and by when they were hired. And it really calls into question uh, this, or it really, I think, demonstrates that the plan violates this concept of equal pay for equal work. Um, so, so far I've been talking about the, um, the plan for current new hires, um, and remember that those hired before 2013 get higher benefits, and that's a, a, quite a big difference over the course of the career. Um, so that someone who was working, let's say, for 40 years, uh, they're going to get about $200,000 less out of the plan if they're hired today than they would have had they been hired before 2013. So this new plan makes the plan even, uh, the new provisions of the plan make um, the retirement plan that much less desirable for um, for new hires. 
in the past, maybe about half of teachers overall would get something out of the plan compared with only 35 percent today. So, so the plan wasn't that great before, but it's uh, worse today for most people. So what can we do about this? Well, we can tweak the, uh, the benefit formula, and there's a bunch of ways that that can be done. Uh, but we could also move to a different plan design. We can move to a hybrid plan, which would shrink the DD portion and replace it with a supplemental or add a, uh, a 401k component to that. Or we could go to a cash balance plan. Now, under cash balance plans, employers contribute a set share of each employee's salary each year to a retirement fund, uh, and that fund earns interest and investment returns. Plan benefits are expressed as an account balance, but investments are pooled and they're professionally managed. And additionally, cash balance plans allow participants to collect their benefits as lifetime annuities as in the traditional plan. Now, another interesting reform option comes from Senator Orrin Hatch, who introduced a bill that would allow states and localities to fund annuities from private insurance companies for their employees. As in a cash balance plan, employers adopting these safe plans, they are called would contribute a portion of each employee's salary each year, but instead of depositing those funds into the public pension plan, they would use them to purchase each year a deferred fixed income life annuity contract for each employee. Now, compared with traditional pension plans, these cash balance plans and safe plans both provide more retirement security for employees who spend less than a full career in public service. Retirement benefits aren't frozen when employees separate under these new plans. Instead, deferred annuities and cash balance plan accounts continue to earn returns until employees retire, even after they've left public service. So that's why uh, relatively short-term employees do better under these plans than under the traditional plan. Now, the safe plans uh, proposed by Senator Hatch also prevent governments from underfunding their retirement benefits because insurance companies wouldn't accept IOUs when issuing deferred annuities. And safe plan participants needn't worry about receiving Allow the annuities if they retire when interest rates are unusually low because the plan uh, issues deferred annuities throughout participants' careers, not all at once. Um, so here are some reform options. We, um, for California, we've worked through um, that, looking at the impact of various reforms. One of the things we did was we were tweaking the, um, the traditional benefit formula. This shows that career uh, this shows the graph we saw earlier. Uh, this is the career average annual employer cost, the share of salary. Our goal is to make this line as flat as possible, which means that you basically get the same uh, um, contribution from your employer regardless of how long you work. So it's not completely flat, but it is uh, much less flat than the earlier graph I showed you. Uh, in this plan, people are vesting after three years. That's why it's zero for the first three years, and then it becomes quite large. This is for a 35-year hire, for a 45-year-old hire, and for a 55-year-old hire. Not perfectly the same. We're still seeing variations, but it is a lot. Uh, the range is much smaller than we saw earlier. In a cash balance plan, it's quite simple to simply get a uh, um, contribution that are just consistent with the same uh, percentage of salary throughout the employee's career. So the cash balance plan is pretty straightforward in terms of treating all workers equally. Um, one thing, too, I wanted to point out was that <laughs> with the uh, traditional plan, the FAS plan, uh, when we got the fairly flat, not perfectly flat, it's really complicated. And, and you can see the details in the, in the paper, but um, it, it just, it's very hard to get that as flat as we did, and again, not perfectly flat. Well, um, and you can see all of our uh, public pension research on our website. There is the, the uh, URL, and you can also just get it pretty easy to find from the urban homepage. Um, I want to talk briefly about our pension tool, which um, is also available on that page. And so what this does is it allows you to actually select your um, the pension parameters and just see how they affect cost and the distribution of that. So one of the things you would do is you first select the final average salary or a cash balance plan. So you click on cash balance plan, you get this, final average salary. Um, here, you can choose if you want uh, to have the worker participate in Social Security or not. Then you set the plan settings um, in terms of the annual, uh, so the multiplier and, and various components. And what, what the plan, what you then see is pension benefits at age 75, the pension wealth, 
uh, the, so the effective value of lifetime benefits and the other contributions, uh, how much of those change with additional years of service, what is the career average annual employer cost, and then what is the replacement rate at age 75, what share of, uh, of earnings does the uh, pension planning combination with Social Security replace in old age. Um, and so when you uh, move these things around, you will then figure out, you can just see how that affects costs and the distribution of benefits and also how it affects our grades there on the side. Um, so thank you, and with that, I'll turn it back to Tracy. Thanks very much, Rich. And now let's go to Bill Gill from the Brookings Institution to talk about Social Security coverage of state and local workers. All right, thank you very much uh, for having me participate in this. Uh, this reporting uh, preliminary findings from a project that I'm doing with uh, Sarah Holmes and David John, who's at AARP. Uh, project is supported by the Arnold Foundation, and the results are preliminary, so we ask that people not quote or cite these results. Uh, the question uh, we're dealing with is is uh, whether state and local government workers uh, should be uh, added to Social Security to the Social Security system. That is the the ones that are not currently in the system. In terms of background, about one quarter of state and local government workers are currently not covered by Social Security in their current job. Some of those are covered under the spousal rule. Some of them are covered under jobs they had in the past. Uh, but then there are provisions that curtail the benefits they get under this uh, situation. The question is whether the remaining state and local government workers should be brought into Social Security via mandatory coverage. And although many of the arguments apply equally well to existing workers uh, versus newly hired workers, we'll follow the convention. Uh, and focus on newly hired uh, workers. Uh, the traditional arguments in this issue uh, tend to focus on the Social Security system, and they argue that mandatory coverage would be a good idea. And I'll go through that in a second. Uh, the more current issue is how does the crisis and tensions affecting states and localities influence this issue, and uh, that's, that's one of the things we'll talk about in a second. I just want to mention, though, as a researcher, the issue is both important and it's educational to study it from both perspectives uh, because they give completely different uh, answers. So in terms of background, uh, uh, state local government workers were not included in the original Social Security deal in the 1930s because there were constitutional concerns about whether the federal government was allowed to tax the state. Uh, in 1950, states were given the option of covering workers in Social Security, and there are a variety of uh, extensions of coverage in the 1950s. Uh, further significant action occurred in the 1980s in the major Social Security forms in 1983. Uh, state and local governments were prohibited from leaving Social Security once they were in the system, and that resulted from the fact that uh, uh, three Texas counties left Social Security uh, in the early 80s. Then in 1986, all newly hired state local government workers were uh, covered by Medicare, which of course uh, has also has an employer-employee tax to it. And then in 1990 in, the, in OBRA, Social Security coverage was, was mandated for all state and local government workers that were not covered by a different retirement uh, package. So, if you look at this issue from the perspective of Social Security, uh, mandatory coverage generates universal uh, support. It would help Social Security finances over the next few decades because it would bring in new workers uh, who wouldn't be retiring for a while. Uh, eventually, it would even out uh, as the state and local government workers age and begin to receive benefits. But certainly, it would give Social Security a, a boost, albeit uh, not a big one. Uh, over the next few decades. Uh, but in addition to the financing issue, there are equity issues. Uh, uh, advocates uh, of including mandatory
of, of, of adding mandatory coverage argue that existing state and local government workers are avoiding paying the Social Security legacy costs that everyone else has to pay. Uh, and, there are, and they argue that so state and local government workers are not contributing to the cost of reducing income distribution, of, of the cost of reducing income inequality uh, that Social Security uh, currently offers. Uh, uh, in both cases, in some of them are uh, inflammatory language, state and local government workers are said to be free riders uh, on the Social Security system. Uh, there's also a third issue, which is that adding Social Security to the portfolio of state and local government workers would improve the quality and quantity of their retirement benefits. Uh, obviously, it would improve security uh, by, by diversifying the sources. Uh, it would likely increase the level of retirement income, but that depends in part on how state and local governments respond. It's hard to see how it would reduce the level of retirement income, though. And it would improve what might be called the quality of retirement benefits. Social Security uh, has automatic in in indexing for inflation, uh, has dependent survivor, spousal, and disability benefits uh, that are superior to the benefits found in most state, state pension uh, plans. So if you read about mandatory coverage in the Social Security world, you find basically everybody supports it despite vast differences in what people think of the overall structure of Social Security, everyone in the Social Security world seems to support mandated coverage. So the Social Security Advisory Board, headed by Ned Paramlik in 1997, split into three groups with very different Social Security reforms, but they all supported mandatory coverage. The National Commission on Retirement Policy did uh, the two budget commissions did, and three major Social Security reform proposals uh, by Aaron and Reischauer, Chauvin Schieber, and Diamond Orzag all supported the idea of mandatory coverage. Uh, the one exception we could find in this rule was the Bush Social Security Commission in 2001, uh, which did not uh, advocate, it didn't oppose mandatory coverage, but didn't advocate mandatory coverage. And uh, interviews with uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan after the fact published interviews uh, argued that, that he faced, that the commission faced enormous political uh, pressure on this issue and he highlighted a whole series of letters that they received. But Moynihan himself had written in the New York Times in 2000 that he actually favored mandatory coverage of new state and local government workers. So uh, uh, whether that was a political decision or an economic decision is, is not exactly clear. Uh, in regard to the Bush uh, Commission. Uh, the viewpoint changes if you move to the perspective of state and local pensions, uh, where it's more complicated. Uh, obviously, the pension concerns highlight issues of retirement income security and quality for, the, for state and local government workers, which suggests the mandatory coverage would be even more helpful than it would be uh, under circumstances where the state and local pensions were doing fine. Uh, on the other hand, the existence of underfunding uh, means that mandatory coverage would raise state costs, divert resources, without doing anything directly to deal with the existing underfunding. And to be clear, what I mean by the existing underfunding uh, comes back to a distinction that Rich made earlier about uh, fully funding new employees versus uh, having fully funded uh, pre-existing employees. Uh, the issue here is that the legacy costs of state and local pensions um, uh, would still be there uh, even if states and localities adjusted their pension benefits for new uh, workers. So let's look at each of those issues uh, in turn. Uh, by way of background on the Social Security coverage of, of state and local workers, I mentioned that about a quarter are not covered. Uh, the highest rates, this is not so much a national issue as it is an issue that's focused in a relatively small number of states. Uh, eight states uh, uh, account for more than 70% of uncovered state and local workers. And as you can see in the slide, the non -coverage, rates of non-coverage are very high. Uh, in those states, Ohio and Massachusetts in the high 90s, Nevada in the 80s, Louisiana in the 70s, uh, and a number of states, uh, other states above 50 
percent. So uh, there's very high rates of coverage in some states, and non-coverage, to the extent that it's an issue, uh, applies mainly uh, in those eight states or 10 or 15 states, uh, which account for almost all of the uncovered workers. So in terms of retirement security issues, we looked at two, at two separate issues. One is uh, looking at state pension benefit levels and social security coverage. Uh, the question here is just do state benefit, do state pensions compensate uh, for the lack of coverage? That is, are benefit levels higher uh, in states where there's low social security coverage for state and local government workers? The answer appears to be uh, yes. It might be a qualified yes, but it seems to be yes. Uh, Alicia Manel and work almost a decade ago found that states with lower social security coverage for their state and local workers uh, had higher benefit accrual rates uh, built into their pensions. Uh, and our preliminary analysis using more recent data generates similar results. Uh, states that have lower social security uh, coverage tend to pay higher uh, pension benefits. What's not quite clear yet is, is is whether the difference, uh, the increase in benefits that get paid with lower coverage is, quote, enough, unquote, uh, to compensate for the lack of Social Security coverage, and that's something we're still working on. Uh, I want to emphasize, though, um, we're not arguing there's a causal relationship between benefit levels and Social Security coverage. We're simply looking at the correlation or the association between the two at this stage and the the empirical fact seems to be what I mentioned, that states that have lower Social Security coverage uh, tend to pay higher pension benefits. Uh, the second retirement security related issue has to do with pension underfunding and Social Security coverage. Here the question is, do the states with low uh, coverage of Social Security tend to also be the states that have the higher amounts of underfunding? And if that's the case, then obviously it's a concern because if underfunding leads to cuts in benefits, uh, it would be better in a general sense if that happened for people who had Social Security as a backstop than if it happened for people that don't have Social Security as a backstop. So the, the preliminary work that we've done there suggests that states that have lower coverage rates uh, do in fact have larger pension underfunding liabilities and so it raises uh, uh, the concern uh, about, about retirement security risk. And again, let me just mention uh, that, that we are not arguing that this is causal. We are not arguing that, that lower coverage is causing higher pension funding, underfunding, or anything like that. We're simply looking at the correlation across states uh, to see if this is a retirement security issue or, or uh, not. So the other issue uh, has to do with the cost. Uh, the benefits of covering state and local workers is the increased retirement security and the quality, higher quality and quantity of benefits. The downside, of course, is these benefits are not free. Uh, they impose costs both on workers and state governments. Uh, the cost issues depend in part on how state and local pensions react, would, would react to the mandatory coverage of, of state and local government workers. Uh, again, uh, Alicia Minnell and work with a couple of co-authors, one of whom is uh, JP, uh, finds that if state and local pensions uh, react in, in, in a way that preserves the net first-year retirement benefit, uh, then that is the, the, the retirement benefit under Social Security and the pension system uh, equals the first-year benefit that would they, they would get under the pension system right now without Social Security then costs of new hires would rise by about 6% of payroll. Uh, and of course, new hires would have to pay their share of the payroll tax as well. 6% of payroll sounds like a lot, but it's only for new hires. And so that would be about 0.15% of state budgets over the next five years would rise to 0.9% in the long run. Uh, the initial effect is tiny uh, because you're multiplying a lot of fractions together. Uh, labor costs is only one part of state budgets. New hires are only one part of labor costs. And payroll taxes are only one part of the cost of new hires. So you multiply all that together, you get 0.15% of state budgets. And then, of course, as over time, the number of people hired after a certain date uh, increases, uh, the portion of the state employees 
and so the new hires become a greater proportion of the workforce, uh, which means that the total cost would climb. Uh, but Manel and her co-authors estimate that it would remain less than 1% uh, of state budget in the long run. Uh, so two other things to note here. One is preserving the first year retirement benefits would lead to greater lifetime benefits under the Social Security and pensions combination than under current pensions uh, because of the higher quality benefits that I mentioned that Social Security offers relative to state pensions. The other thing to note is that costs would go up even if lifetime benefits were unchanged because some of the costs are the legacy costs of, of Social Security. All right, so uh, I, let me briefly touch on the constitutional issues. Uh, as I say tongue-in-cheek, perhaps a little bit, but maybe a lot, you should ignore this slide. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, the issue here is whether the federal government can impose taxes on the states. Uh, I just want to mention that the three changes in the 80s and early 90s all seem to have imposed federal mandates and federal taxes on state governments. That is, in 83, federal law prohibited states from leaving Social Security. Uh, in 86, new state local workers were required to be enrolled in Medicare. In 1990, federal law required states to enroll workers without a pension into Social Security. All of those things seem like mandates to me. Uh, uh, a variety of other commentators have argued that this is not an issue, uh, but of course, you should not take legal advice from economists. Uh, and in my view, you should not take economic advice from a lawyer, but that's up to you. So in contrast to the wide support for mandatory coverage in the Social Security community, there's wide condemnation of mandatory coverage in the state and local pension world. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that the only two groups that don't want mandatory coverage of state and local government workers are the workers themselves and state and local government. Uh, the costs are the most common explanation, the added costs. There's obviously concern of benefit reductions or, or that Social Security coverage would, would instigate complete system overhaul and threaten existing benefits. Uh, and of course, uh, Social Security involves obligations as well as benefits. Uh, I mentioned the free riding issue earlier on the equity side of Social Security. So um, uh, given that, some of the, at least some of this opposition should not be surprising, um, but it is out there as a political constraint. So let me conclude uh, here. Proponents of mandatory coverage emphasize the benefits of mandatory coverage. Those who oppose it emphasize the cost. Uh, what's a little uh, frustrating is that both sets of arguments are right. Uh, there are benefits and costs uh, from uh, including mandatory coverage. And uh, policymakers, uh, therefore, will face a very difficult uh, political decision. Uh, but, in, but let's be clear, and part of that is because the economics of it is hard, are, are hard, as well as the uh, politics. So let me stop there. I'd be happy to take questions. So I think we might have JP on the line now. So let's try that one more time with his presentation. Uh, J.P. Aubrey, Assistant Director of State and Local Research at Boston College's Center for Retirement Research. J.P., are you there? Can you hear me? Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, get my fingers crossed. Good. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, we had a little technical difficulty in the beginning, but um, I will begin as quickly and go through as quickly as possible, give me some time for questions. Um, so my, my presentation focuses, focuses a little bit more on the, um, I guess I am, yes, yeah, so I'm still having problems switching slides, so I'll just have to have you um, move the slides for me. Okay. okay. Um, so as, my, as the title states, pension reforms and the state and local budget squeeze, uh, my, my presentation is going to focus a little bit more or, or much more on the, on the budget and employer side and, and how recent reforms have um, played out on, on that side of the equation. I think the two presentations focused a little bit more on the employees and their retirement security, um, and I'll touch on that a little bit, but much more about budgets. So um, if we go to the next slide. Um, you know, this is not going to be news to many people that are, are here, but 
uh, you know, we just experienced two financial crises over the past decade, and, and uh, you know, the direction of these uh, two figures basically tells the whole story. On the left, you have a drop in funding uh, from 100% in 2001 down to 72 in 2013, um, and the arc has gone up uh, as funding has gone down to about uh, from about 6% of payroll, 7% of payroll to nearly 18% of payroll. Uh, next slide. Um, even so, uh, you know, on average, pension costs today uh, remain around 5% of budgets. Um, so that uh, tells a slightly different story than, you know, if you're looking at the 17 or 20% of payroll numbers, we look at the percent of budget, it still seems a somewhat, uh, from our perspective, a somewhat modest, modest portion of state and local. Um, this is own source revenues, so really they're tax dollars um, and their taxing power. Okay. So in the long term, the pension burden for states and localities will depend on three things, right? contributions by the employers, returns on plan assets, and uh, the generosity of the benefit package, which I'll be focusing on the most um, in terms of the reforms. Okay. Um, you know, on the con contribution side, uh, states and localities have started to increase the percent of ARC paid. Uh, so here we have a chart showing um, percent of ARC paid since 2001, and basically you can see it move. Um, with the market kind of in, in an inverse way. As the market was better and costs were lower, uh, plans paid more. Um, and after the first downturn in 2002 and funding began to erode um, and ARCs began to go up, plans did not continue to meet that obligation. Um, you know, when the market up turn, turned up again, uh, plans were more able to make their contributions. Uh, and you're, you're kind of seeing a similar turn after the 2008 and nine crisis, and we're hoping to see a continued rise in the percent of ARC as um, finances stabilize, okay? Um, and on the return side, at least on the assumed return, return side, plans are, are using a lower assumed return to calculate liabilities. It used to be around 8% in 2001 um, and high, even higher before that, and now it's uh, right around 7.7 .7, um, and probably uh, climbing lower in 2014. Okay. So finally, uh, what I'm going to be focusing on most is, is the benefit side. Um, and one of the major things that a lot of sponsors have done to immediately impact their budgets is to cut back on excessive colas. Uh, and so what we have here is just a chart um, of the United States showing various states where cola cuts have been made. In the red, you have where they have uh, eliminated the cola completely or lowered uh, the, the maximum cola that can be applied. Um, and in the hatch states, you have those that have reduced the cola guarantee. Um, you know, in these hatch states, they're offering um, or striped states, excuse me, they're offering, you know, 3% colas regardless of CPI. Um, and so in a lot of those areas, uh, they've just kind of reduced that to 2% or 1.5%. Um, in our eyes, you know, this is more of a realignment of the cola to better reflect inflation rather than kind of a cutting of, of colas. And so that's where we see most of the activity in places where um, either the, the CPI maximum was, was too high or they had a guarantee that was not related to CPI, and that's where you've seen a lot of adjustments. Okay. Um, and on the plan design side, you've seen an emphasis on risk sharing um, through hybrids and cash balance plans, not just defined contribution plans. Um, so here's a, a chart, a timeline showing uh, kind of the uh, introduction of DCs in various state plans. Um, and what you see is prior to the financial crisis, so the dotted line on the right kind of marks before and after, um, you have a lot of introduction. Uh, introduction of, mo of a lot of DCs and most of them optional. So you're giving an employee an option to go to a DC or stay in the DB. After the crisis, what you see is a shift to mandatory um, hybrid or cash balance plan. So forcing new hires to go into some DB, DC or cash balance arrangement. So that was kind of a, what we thought was a shift in, in kind of the paradigm of, of, of new plans um, that is really about a risk sharing element um, rather than, than shifting to DCs. So, you know, to get a better sense, or really uh, a more in-depth kind of study, uh, we did a more in-depth study of the recent reforms in uh, 15 states and 32 plans across 15 states. Um, and so here's just a map of, of the places we've chosen. And they were selected um, roughly to kind of represent, you know, well-funded plans that are somewhat expensive, so New York, uh, California, or CalPERS, CalSTRS is poorly funded, uh, and to represent kind of plans that are poorly funded and poorly managed, the New Jersey's, the Illinois out there, and then uh, to represent plans that were kind of well-managed and well-funded, so Florida and Georgia 
Um, and uh, so those, that's kind of what we were attempting to do with this uh, smattering of, 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 of plans and states was to kind of capture various scenarios um, um, without having to do the whole nation. Uh, so the first thing we did is kind of a detailed analysis, and this this whole analysis is actually available for each of our states on our website, and you can we do a kind of neat little fact sheet that explains what plans have done, what they were like prior to the crisis, uh, how costs have, had increased during the crisis, and then how reforms, what reforms were made, and how those impact long-term costs. So there is a kind of a state-by-state, plan-by-plan analysis that's available on our website for each of these plans. Um, so we did a detailed analysis for every plan, looking at um, uh, member contributions, employer contributions, so member contributions are the bottom bar, the kind of dark gray, member con uh, employer contributions being the light gray, and the employer contributions to the unfunded liability being the white. And so you have member contributions, employer normal cost, and uh, the UAL portion being the upper, um, the upper bar. And what you see here is what you see for most plans, that essentially, um, you know, all the increase in costs from the crisis comes from a drop in assets and increase the unfunded liability. Um, and then as a result of that, you see a cut in the benefits being provided to uh, new hires. Um, and usually the member contribution stays where it is or goes up. And any reduction in the total benefits, which is uh, represented here as a reduction in the total normal cost, member contributions plus employer contributions to the normal cost give you the total normal cost. Um, any reductions to that benefit package are um, recouped by the by the employee employer. So the member contribution kind of stays the same. Any reduction the employer kind of takes um, for themselves in, in reduction of the employer normal cost. And as you can see over time, as more new hires uh, come into the system and replace uh, current employees, you get uh, a reduction from where the current rate is after the crisis to where it will ultimately be when everybody's a new hire. Um, and that's kind of this chart we've created for every plan. Okay. Um, what was interesting in our analysis is that, you know, 29 of the 32 plans we've looked at responded by reducing the benefit package. So, you know, it it was clear that, that um, plans were responding and that something was being done. Um, for the most part, it was for new employees. As you can see in this chart here, the red uh, shows the numbers above kind of show the number of states that have done each type of change. The red bar shows uh, what proportion of those changes were done for just new employees, and the gray is uh, what was done for all employees. And for the most part, um, any changes to the core benefit were for um, were for new hires, so age and tenure requirements, extending their retirement age, changing the average salary period. Um, uh, in terms of the benefit factor, uh, one. The states that were able to do something for the benefit factor for all employees uh, were really, uh, there were really three, it was Rhode Island um, and Ohio uh, was able to do something without going to the court system. Uh, they were able to change benefits going forward for current employees um, in some uh, graded way where those that were closer to retirement got less of a cut and those that were further from retirement got a greater cut. Um, and then beyond that, uh, the contribution rate was changed for all employees almost across the board, um, and COLA impacted all employees generally. So there was a lot of flexibility in the COLA in terms of applying cuts to new hires and current employees. Okay. Um, another interesting takeaway from these 32 plans was that uh, the actions that were taken were somewhat calibrated to their circumstances. So uh, you saw plans that were worse funded um, make greater cuts, and plans that had higher normal costs um, compared to the average, um, make greater greater cuts. So on the left, you have kind of poorly funded plans where their normal cost for the employer was pre-crisis and where it was after the reform. And poorly funded plans go from 7.8 to 3.3, um, so kind of a 4.5% uh, um, uh, reduction. And then for well-funded plans, you have them going from 8.5 to 5.6, which is only a 2.9% reduction. So you see a greater reduction for uh, for poorly funded plans than well-funded. And you see a similar pattern on the right for plan generosity. Those that started with higher normal costs made greater cuts than those that started with lower normal costs. So it was um, uh, heartening for us to kind of see that these cuts were, were made with some uh, that were calibrated somewhat to the issue that each state uh, or state plan had. 
Okay. Um, but for the most poorly funded plans, uh, still benefit cuts often more than offset increased costs so that, you know, the increase in costs due to the unfunded liability um, was more than um, offset by the benefit cut so such that, you know, the benefit cut was, if you're looking at kind of returning to past costs, these benefit cuts actually exceeded what was needed. Um, and so here's just a chart um, displaying that, showing kind of uh, how many plans offset uh, did offset the cut almost nearly perfectly in a reduction of, to benefits. Um, what plans kind of not did not do enough in terms of benefit cuts to offset the increase due to the, due to the crisis, and what plans did more than enough. Um, and you can and and that chart kind of bears that out. Okay. So after we've done all analysis for each individual plan, um, looking at what, what reforms they specifically did and their increase in cost, um, we went from looking at plan costs to state budget costs, because we really think that's where um, where the rubber kind of meets the road. And so uh, we project the cost at the state level. Um, and what we show here is basically uh, an example for Ohio, but we did this for every, every state, aggregating up all their plans cost. And you have a line showing the pre-crisis reforms pre-crisis cost would have been had there been no financial crisis. That's the black line. Uh, the red line is the uh, cost after, after the crisis if there had not been a reform. And then the blue line is, is where the cost would be given the reform. And this pattern is, is, uh, is common across all states. Essentially, you see that uh, prior, uh, that after the reform, you find after 30 years that the overall pension cost as a percent of budget would be similar to where you would have been had the crisis never occurred. Um, okay. And this is a chart that kind of shows that, makes that point. On the whole, cuts uh, that were made to new higher benefits should reduce pressure on, sp on the budgets of uh, state and local governments to below pre-crisis levels. And so here you have kind of a pre-crisis um, budget costs where they were post-crisis, uh, where they were kind of midway through reforms when basically half the employees are new hires and where they'll ultimately be after everybody's a new hire. And uh, for our thir 32 plans um, and these 15 states, we found that on average, in aggregate, excuse me, um, that pension costs, uh, pension benefit costs would more than offset any increased costs. So that cost would be lower than they were pre-crisis in 30 years. Um, next. Everything? Right, these last two slides were, were meant to be kind of a setup for um, Rich. And, uh, and so uh, what we're looking at here is that, you know, cutting benefit costs, you can look at it from a budget aspect and a lot of a lot of cuts, unfortunately, have been done with budget, a budget framework in mind only. Um, but these cuts are not are not costless uh, for the for the taxpayer um, and or for the for the for the government um, because they're part of total compensation. And we did an analysis a while back that looked at uh, comparing total compensation between public and private sector employers controlling for employees, excuse me, controlling for human capital, uh, you know, things like age. Um, education and so forth, and found basic parity. I think state and local workers were 2% more compensated than private sector workers of similar skills. Um, and so we call that basic parity. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, we just did a recent study that, that showed the quality gap measured as the wage that a state and local employee would get in the private sector. So we compared people entering and leaving the private sector, uh, excuse me, leaving and entering the public sector in the CPS. We compared their private sector wage before they came in or right after they went out. Um, and the gap between the private sector wage of people coming in and out of public sector employment, once you control for age and um, education and so forth, was directly related to the, to the normal cost by each plan, the benefit given. So if you uh, were giving a larger pension, uh, that gap um, in, in kind of quality of worker, essentially, the private sector wage they'd get otherwise, um, would grow. And so it just that kind of just shows that these benefits um, are part of a compensation package and as such would definitely impact the quality of employee you get when you make adjustments to that. Okay. Um, and so my conclusion just rehashes kind of everything I said, so I don't know if I, um, in the interest of having uh, questions, I'm just going to go right through it. And I think I'll, leave, I'll, I'll just uh, not have the, uh, I won't do the, um, 
my website either. It's fine. Thank you so much. So I think we still have a fair number of people online, but we don't have any questions yet. So I'm going to take the okay. moderator's prerogative and ask um, two questions that I'd like each speaker to respond to. You can pick which one you'd like to respond to. Um, as someone who studies state and local government finance, I think variety is the spice of life, and I've noticed that both JP and Bill presented statistics for the sector as a whole. So the cost of um, joining Social Security would be less than 1% for state and local governments as a whole. Um, the burden on state budgets is 5% um, overall, and then you showed some differences before and after reforms. But I just wonder if either of you have looked at heterogeneity, and I know Bill talked about sort of differences in coverage across states, but also differences in cost. And then more to the retirement security question, I guess um, in a lot of cases we've talked about reforms that would sort of take an arrow out of the quiver of state and local governments in terms of their ability to manage their workforces. So if you think that it's important to um, select a certain type of worker, not just in terms of their private sector wage, but their willingness to invest in a certain set of skills in the public sector, what does um, putting more public sector workers into Social Security or um, providing retirement benefits more as sort of a uh, 401k style benefit do in terms of that selection um, ability? Which one of you? Uh, sure. So I'll, I'll tackle the second question, which is about the retirement security. Um, first of all, I, I would say that uh, Social Security is a, is a great um, plan for a lot of people. Um, it, it achieves a lot of the goals that, um, that I set out earlier in, in the sense that um, w one of the unique things about Social Security is that it's tied to, your benefits are tied to your lifetime earnings and those earnings that you receive early in your career uh, increase with uh, wage growth. So uh, unlike in a traditional uh, defined benefit plan like the state and local, most state and local plans have, uh, most state and local governments have, uh, it's not the case that if you, um, you know, that, that, that the benefit you earn at age 25 is really tiny um, because it's based on that really low earnings, it's really based on much higher earnings. Um, so so I, I do think that there's a lot of in terms of the, the quality of the benefit that Social Security gets, in addition to, I think, uh, Bill mentioned, the, uh, you're getting the uh, index annuity, which is hard to, to get uh, purchased on the private market. Uh, so there's a lot of, of reasons for um, moving to a, a Social Security plan. In terms of, um, you know, are, are we uh, making it difficult for, but by moving to a retirement plan that's backloaded, or make it difficult to, to, uh, to retain workers for many years? Um, I think we look at the evidence, at least among teachers, you just see, and in fact, among every plan that we've looked at, uh, we see that the majority of uh, employees actually leave within uh, 10 years, um, or at least 12 years. So, so people are not saying that 25, 30 years that they need under the existing plan. So, so I don't think the existing plan is working to the workers, so I mean to, to retain these long-term employees, so I think it's, it's worth looking at. Uh, sure, thank you. This is Bill. Um, I, uh, uh, the heterogeneity by state in coverage rates on uh, pension benefit levels and underfunding uh, is crucial to understanding uh, the retirement security benefits of mandated coverage. And so, so uh, I think that point's worth emphasizing. Uh, on the ability to manage the workforce, uh, state and local governments, uh, I think the you know, the private sector has more for a defined contribution plan. And I think the key question is, what are the characteristics of state and local government workforce? And again, that's going to vary with across states and within states. Uh, and which of those types of jobs do you need the, the quote unquote management incentives uh, provided by a DB plan? Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting question, but I don't think there's a one size fits all. JP, do you want to add anything? Yeah, and um, I, I would love to. Yeah, in terms of the, the benefit cuts, and really, the heterogeneity um, in terms of in terms of the budget, and, I mean, there are. Uh, it really depends on what the, what the changes have been in terms of the impact of that on the on the uh, on the employee, right? If places like Illinois, where they've gone from you know, four-year vesting to eight-year vesting, and that's how they cut their normal costs. They're basically assuming no one's going to make it <laughs> to the vesting point uh, because a lot of people leave early, um, and even more will leave, you know, before the vesting period. That's very different than 
uh, having lower benefits for your employees because you're having them, you know, normal retirement age, but get pushed out from 62 to 65. Um, you know, may end up with the same change in normal costs, but has very different implications for your your human resource needs. And um, and so, you know, I, I agree with your point that there is a lot of heterogeneity in kind of how these benefits have been cut and what that means for your for your workforce. Um, and it's not clear. I mean, I don't know enough about the HR needs for every state to know if that was part of the um, the reform process. Really thinking about what these what these cuts mean, and I mean, ideally, the work that um, that Rich is doing will help inform that <laughs> going forward to get a really a really good sense of kind of what that means for how your how people's benefits are accruing. In terms of the 401k um, conversation, um, you know, I would like to say, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong about a 401k plan um they can be they can provide just as secure retirement um as as a db and they can also allow for more mobility of of, of the workforce um you know right now public sector employees get a really raw deal if they don't stay for 25 or 30 years as as rich has shown uh, and, and at the state and local level at least uh at the you know in the state and local dc plans um, a lot of the problems that we find in the private sector in terms of defined contribution, the leakages, the lack of participation, the contribution rates that are too low, um, they've attempted to uh, address those pretty aggressively. And so that the, the DCs you see in the public sector are not the kind of DCs you see in the private sector. They have better contribution rates. They have auto escalation, auto enrollment. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's not clear to me that that that. You know, DCs in the public sector are, are a bad thing. There's some risk sharing. They're kind of run, I think, run better, um, and uh, and they do, you know, give something to the. There, there, there's likely some class of employee in state and local employment that um, is not going to stay there for for 10, 20 years. I can think of high burnout kind of social work kind of jobs that, it, you know, it's there's probably a lot of turnover in those fields because um, a lot of kind of stress and so. Uh, having something for those types of employees, um, I think, would be would be desirable for a state and local government trying to retain all of its quality workforce or attract all of its quality workforce. Okay. We're a little over time, but we're going to answer some more questions if, if people who are online can bear with us. So we have a question from Ellen about um, the study of CalSTRS and what was the rationale for looking at a retired teacher at age 75? Uh, and let me uh, just point out that I think when I was speaking in the beginning, I'm not sure I was heard, um, but um, this work is joined with my colleagues here at Urban Institute, so Owen Haga and Ben Southgate, and this tool that we're uh, developing was is built primarily by Ben Southgate, so I want to acknowledge his contributions. We're looking at uh, folks at age 75. The idea is to look at really um, retirement income security for older people, people who aren't uh, who are much less likely to be working than, let's say, a 65-year-old. Um, and so also uh, basically we're assuming that everyone stops working by 75. So we don't have, if we're looking at 65, then we have a problem of, well, what about the person who's, who's starting at age uh, 35 and working for 35 years? Uh, that person isn't yet collecting a pension. So when we're looking at uh, someone who's age 75, it, in, it incorporates both the impact of what is the, the – Base benefit, and then also the impact of colas. So that if the cola is being reduced, um, we would see that impact played at uh, affecting 75-year-olds less likely to affect 65-year-olds. Uh, we also had a question from Indra about how to educate retirees as well as the current workforce on the need for changes and develop programs for them um, to build their own retirement security. Uh, mm, that's a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we haven't. Um, certainly, that that's a problem. I, I think when um, you know you look at these plans, they're incredibly complicated, and we spent a lot of time trying to understand them. So I think the problem is, is that a lot of people really don't understand the incentives, don't understand how much more. I mean, you know, they they sort of do when they don't understand. So so people get the general idea; they know that they should work until they can qualify for benefits, and you do see um, retention rates changing a little bit at that time. Um, but on the other hand. Um, you know, uh, people aren't really fully aware of, of the uh, really how, how serious uh, their retention decisions 
can have, how serious those decisions can be on the retirement income security. So I think that is is important to try to educate um, workers. We you know, there's a lot of studies showing that people don't understand their pension plans, and that's that's true really across the board, but particularly true for these complex uh, traditional plans. And, and oftentimes, you know, for the the rhetoric, you know, the the rhetoric for for DB plans is you know has been for their for the long service employees, the long term employees, and so you don't see I mean, at least in the you know member handbooks and other kind of things I've read um, uh, these benefit handbooks. Oftentimes, the you know the, the replacement rate or the benefit you get is is is, is just presented for the for the long service employee and they anytime they mention kind of leaving leaving early um uh it's kind of an aside and so there there may be something some area there when when um presenting the db plan to participants um you know having a little more space for for alternative outcomes beyond just the employee and i can see why they do it i mean the, you know they want to have long term employees that's kind of the setup for the db and that's and that's that's kind of been the the goal to this point to to keep and retain quality workers, and so that's to that end, you know, the kind of worker they they generally focus on and, and present outcomes for are that are that are that type of employee, um, and, and the type of um, uh, training and, and seminars that uh, many state and local employers do provide their employees uh, is really geared toward the older employees. So not yeah. really thinking about financial literacy over the life course and, and and what younger people should do to prepare for retirement. Yeah, actually, we had a question about intergenerational equity online, and I also uh, was at an event where I heard the former budget director of Michigan say that really he feels that he's dealing with two workforces. There's the workforce that started at a certain date that has a certain type of pension, and new hires, as you point out. So uh, what do you do about these sort of intergenerational equity issues within a plan? Is that, on the re is that the plan's responsibility to sort of educate workers about that? Should they be educating um, the public more about that because you see a lot of ire directed at public sector workers who may not be reaping the generous benefits people have been reading about in the newspaper. Yeah, I, I certainly think that this, these sort of multi tiered systems we have are a problem. Um, we have people working side by side, they're getting very different compensation. The cost of that, um, that that's an issue. I'm not sure it's probably, I, I cannot imagine that it would be in the employer's. Uh, uh, advantage to point that out to people that you know they're they're getting a raw deal. Um, so so exactly how we we educate them, uh, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, I mean I definitely think it's, it's a real important problem. I think the intergenerational issue weighs in not just on the employee morale side, but uh, on the issue of how we cover the cost of state and local pension benefits. The rich one of the first slides Rich put up said basically new obligations should be fully funded, and that that seems right to me. That you know from today forward, uh, any new pension obligation should be funded, uh, should be fully funded, and therefore incorporated as part of the workers' benefits and costs, trading off wages versus pension benefits, etc. Uh, the existing pension liabilities, however. Uh, uh, seem to me to fall in the category of legacy costs that should be borne by the state as a whole, not not the workers themselves. Uh, the workers themselves uh, had foregone wage income that they accepted in exchange for the higher pension benefit, and if the state uh, did not put aside sufficient funds, that seems like an obligation that the state needs to meet uh, from all of the states. Uh, taxpayers. Uh, so I think there's a sharp distinction. I think the intergenerational issue generates a sharp distinction between already existing liabilities and newly created liabilities. Yeah, we had this. Yeah, we had this discussion. I mean, in in Massachusetts, where you know I've talked to some uh, Massachusetts officials who are, are really you know knowledgeable and and um, and even even they had a hard time understanding um, that. The, multi, the majority of Massachusetts pension costs is for unfunded liabilities, and we were promising pensions for 75 years and only funded the, only started funding them in the, in the late 80s, and so or in the mid 80s, and so um, and most of the costs are really uh, unfunded liability. In point of fact, employees pay 
95% of their benefit um, in, in member contributions. And that's just that's something that's kind of not understood um, in in Massachusetts. And so, yeah, it's kind of separating what is the kind of current cost of, a, of benefits for an employee working today versus kind of what's, what's legacy costs is, is a really important conversation. And, and a lot of the reform uh, discussions, you know, we've at the center, we've uh, worked with various states or officials that are kind of looking for help in this issue and how to think about it. And one of the um, uh, kind of suggestions we give a lot is, is finding some way uh, politically or just in, in the discourse to separate the unfunded liability and the ongoing benefits for the pension system. Um, because it seems like this is, for mo many states that are in trouble, this, this legacy cost is what's hanging over them, and they have to separate that from um, from, from the rest of the, of the pension benefits currently being accrued and find some way to, to you know, bond that debt, dedicate a tax, do whatever you have to do, and kind of take, take the responsibility for that and set up a system going forward where you don't end up here again. And that... Um, that's really the kind of the trade-off you're giving a taxpayer saying, we know this is a, this is a promise we made, but we're uh, going to figure out how to pay, pay for this and set up a system where we won't have to deal with this again. And people always talk about risk sharing, and I was like to say, well, you know, we, we're having risk sharing right now. It's happening. <laughs> it's happening through employee benefit cuts. It's just happening, and it's happening through, through employee benefit cuts to new hires. And it's, a, it's happening in kind of a haphazard, reactive type of way af after the issue um, hits. Um, and one way you might think of designing plan going forward is to the extent that some of these challenges are foreseeable is uh, having some kind of protocol or having some kind of uh, way to address them that's kind of written out that, you know, when returns are go this bad, we're going to do this to COLA, increase employee contributions by X and increase employee contributions by X. And everyone kind of knows this going forward. And so that if you're going to invest in inequities, you're going to take on risk um, to fund the system. They need to have some policy for handling the risk when it when, it, when it's realized. Um, and so, rather than this kind of reactive way where where it hits and all of a sudden, you know, we're just we're slashing benefits here, increasing contributions there, and doing it kind of an ad hoc, reactive, and not necessarily thoughtful way. Great, thank you. So, I think we all agree there's a lot more education of policymakers and public sector workers and voters and. Um, I should say policymakers at all levels of government. I think the federal level has an interest in knowing about this as well. Um, and uh, so we all have our work cut out for us. There was one question um, from Brian about funding. Um, Bill Gale mentioned Arnold involvement. Just a point of clarification, this research at Urban was supported by a diversity of sources, including the Arnold Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and other donors that are all on our website. Um, and we, as a matter of policy, do not take money that, does, uh, that would require us to conflict with our mission, which is to open minds, shape decisions, and inform policy through research. And so if there's anything that you think we need to understand better for our research or any points of clarification, uh, please do stay in touch and let's continue the conversation. Thank you very much.